And I'm just going to read from the scriptures at this point. I want to just read from 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you remember the theme for the, from this morning, as announced, Amazing Grace to a Dead Dog. I wonder, were you thinking about a man by the name of Mephibosheth? Let's read just a few verses in 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're reading, of course, from the authorised version. We're reading from verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. And David said, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And they had called him unto David. The king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame in his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel in Lodibar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar, the son of Amiel from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant? that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 8. And we pray God will stamp his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text tonight is taken from Second Samuel chapter 9 and the verse 8. And my subject this evening, as already has been announced, Amazing Grace to... A dead dog. Look at verse 8 of our reading. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Now, Second Samuel chapter 9 is a beautiful passage of scripture. I've only read a part of it. To me, it is one of the most compassionate stories in the whole of the Bible. You see, it's all about the grace and kindness of King David toward a young man by the name of Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son. Mephibosheth, therefore, was the grandson of Israel's first king by the name of Saul. Uh, sadly, both Jonathan and Saul died at the same time and the very same day uh, in battle uh, with the uh, army of David. A seven year civil war had engulfed Israel at that time. Now, Mephibosheth was aged five when the death of Jonathan and Saul took place. He was living at the royal palace in Jerusalem. And when news came that Saul and Jonathan were dead, uh, Mephibosheth's nurse, she picked him up and fled with them. And somewhere along the route, she, she dropped the child so much so that the child became lame in both feet. And she again picked him up and carried him to a place 60 miles away from Jerusalem called Lodabar. And he's grown up now. He, he's become a man. But he's still lame in both feet. David, when he is crowned king, the, the land settles down. He makes inquiries, and this is what he asks, Is there any yet left that of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? David wanted to know, was there any left of the house of Saul? 
David found out there was. He wanted to know who he is and where he was. And David therefore sent a summons to Lodibar to Mephibosheth. And the thought is of Mephibosheth coming the 60 mile journey from Lodabar to Jerusalem. He comes trembling in before the king. He says in verse 6, when his name is called, Behold thy servant. Uh, he's full of fear. Listen to verse 7. David said unto him, Fear not. There's one of the fear nots of the Bible. 365 of them in the scriptures. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Now notice his reaction. And he bowed himself. Notice what he said. What is thy servant that thou should look upon such a dead dog as I am? Hence the title, Amazing Grace for a Dead Dog. Now three things just in the next 10 or 12 minutes. First of all, there's a dreadful state here. Think of the words, a dead dog. Mephibosheth describes himself, acknowledges himself to be a dead dog. Here's the depth to which Mephibosheth has come to as far as life is concerned. In the presence of King David, this is how he pictures himself. Remember, this is the first time King David and him have met. And what does he do in the presence of the king? He calls himself a dead dog. That's how he regarded himself. This was a self-proclamation. He's in the palace. He's just heard the news that I'm going to show you kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and on top of that I'm going to restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. On top of that you're going to eat bread at my table, and you're going to do it continually. And when he hears that, he, he, he hears his reaction, he, he bows himself to the ground, he, he acclaims in the presence of David, I am a dead dog. He feels himself as nothing, as unworthy in the presence of the king. This lameness was as a result of the fall. Mephibosheth was saying to the king, I, I, I'll never amount to anything. I, I, I'll not excel in anything. I couldn't be in the army. I, I couldn't be a, a foot soldier. I, I, I certainly couldn't be a sergeant or a commander-in-chief. I couldn't even be a household servant or a chief steward. There's going to be no opportunity for me that's going to mark me out because I'm lame as a result of a fall. I'm not going to be able to stand in the light of the many mighty men that's all around you, David. I, I'd be of no value or, or no worth unto you. See, he's recalling in his mind the day that he was dropped by the nurse. Remember what Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan of yet a son, verse 3, which is lame on his feet. He suffered much due to a fall. Keep that in mind. Also, he lost all that he had. You see, Mephibosheth, when he was born, had two names. He was called Mephibosheth, but he's also called uh, Mary Ball. He was born into the royal family, the grandson of the first King Saul. He was the son of Prince Jonathan. As I've said, at five years of his life, here he is living as a royal child. Could you imagine those privileges? He's got his own nurse. He's going to have private tuition. He's going to have all the trappings of a privileged life, the best of food, the best of clothing, the best room. He could look back to better and happier times. But he's lost it all. David has said to him, I will restore unto thee all the land of Saul thy father. See, he knows that he'd lost all that he had. And also, he's languishing in a far-off place. 
Where is he living? It mentions in the reading, in verse 4 and 5, this place called Lodibar. Now, now that's a strange place. And you know what it means? It means no pasture. Lo means no. Debar has to do with pasture. No pasture. In other words, it's a place of barrenness. There's no fruit trees where I live. There's no green grass. There's no wheat fields. It also means, Lodibar, a place of nothing. The place of nothingness. Now, now that's where the young man's living. In the barren place with nothing. And he's got no words from the king. 60 miles from Jerusalem. And he's there, of course, because he wants to be as far away from David as possible. And I want you to get the picture. Living in the place of nothingness. Living a a life of pointlessness. A a life without meaning. And you know this dreadful state of Mephibosheth? That's a picture of every sinner outside of Jesus Christ. Because every sinner outside of Jesus Christ is lame, spiritually lame. Can't walk with God and fellowship with him because as a result of the fall. The the fall of Adam and the sin. And in Adam we lost all that we had. All our rights and privileges. There's no such thing as human rights here as far as the uh, fall of Adam and us in the loins of Adam. And many sinners tonight are without God in this world. They're without hope. And they have no attachment to the things of God. Isn't this what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and in the verse 12 whenever he um, was speaking to the church at Ephesus and writing to the Christians there to remind them of their former state and condition. He said at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. See, see, that's a picture. And this young man is aware of his state and condition. And here he's been ushered into the presence of the king for the first time. And the king's told him, I'm going to treat you kindly and you don't deserve it. And how did he react? He confessed his true state and condition. He owned up to what he was. He he could say, um, as far as... um, himself was concerned that that he was a dead dog in the sight of King David. That's how he perceived himself. Now in the presence of the living and the true God, how do you perceive yourself tonight? Can you say with David, I acknowledge my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid? I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Remember what he says in Psalm 51, um, making a tremendous statement, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. A dreadful state here. Notice something else. There is a diligent summons here. It says in verse 6, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of David, was come unto David. You see, I want you to understand that there's an offer in the summons. And the offer is to come into my presence. And of course, David takes the initiative because he asked, Is there any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. See, David the king takes the initiative. Here's the amazement and the wonder of the grace and kindness of King David towards Mephibosheth. It wasn't left to Mephibosheth to come. He just didn't decide, well, I'll travel from Lodibar to the king's palace and hope to get an audience with the king. No, it was the king himself that initiated this Offer to come. You know when it comes to salvation. 
Jonah 2 and 4, it said, salvation is of the Lord. You see, true salvation starts with the Lord. You've heard what Paul has said, that, that he was at enmity against God. He hated the things of God. He had no desire or thought. And then all of a sudden, there was a change started to take place in his heart and mind. And that which he hated, he began to love. Now, where did that change come about? That, that change came about because the, the Lord himself took the initiative and broke into his heart and life and warmed his heart to Christ and the gospel. See, the Lord made the first move. Without the Lord coming in grace and mercy through the work of the Spirit, we'll never be saved. For by grace... Are you saved through faith? And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is God's undeserved, unmerited favour shown to criminals and lawbreakers. David said, though poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. See, understand tonight, you're a creature made in God's image. You're a special human being. You're unique in that sense. And yet as a creature made in the image of God, you're marred and defaced by sin. Because you're a sinner by nature and practice. And we sinned in Adam. And that's how and why we are sinners. And therefore we're fallen creatures. And we deserve judgment because of our sin. The wages of sin is death. And yet the Lord has taken the initiative. The Lord has come in grace and in mercy. To find the sinner. To reveal himself to the sinner. To save the sinner. Remember Luke 15. The parable of the lost sheep. 99 sheep in the sheepfold. The shepherd discovers one was lost. What does he do? Does he leave it alone? No. He goes after it. He takes the initiative to find his lost sheep. And if you're here tonight without hope and without God and without Christ. You're like a lost sheep. And you deserve nothing from God. But what your sins deserve, which is wrath and punishment for the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And David takes the initiative. Isn't it amazing? Now think of this, that he shows kindness to a relative of Saul. Doesn't mention maid of the house of Saul. He's prepared to be a very gracious individual. Mephibosheth doesn't deserve it. King David could have said, but remember, Saul treated me badly. He, he oppressed me. He opposed me. He despised me. He wanted to take my life from me on a number of occasions. He made my life a, a misery, a, a, a wee hell and earth in that sense. And um, he, he was out to destroy me. And yet, it was a relative in the house of Saul that David chose to show kindness. Maybe I could just throw in something here for those of you who are Christians. We ought to be gracious toward one another. Doesn't the Bible tell us there in the book of Ephesians? On Ephesians chapter 4, he makes an amazing statement in the verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You see, everything we have is for Christ's sake. The offer to come to God as we are and confess our sin. God in grace makes that genuine offer. The Lord would say to you tonight, if you're without Christ, come as you are. Come come from the depths of sin and shame. Come in light of my summons. See, David had fear in his heart. He had his own ideas and thoughts about appearing before the king. It was an inbuilt fear. No doubt the nurse, the nurse had told him, if you go to David and take away your life, the day you stand before him is the day you're a dead man. Maybe David was pictured as being a monster who wanted to wipe out Saul's family. And his mind was full of fear. And do you know something tonight? There's many a, a, a man or woman who's without Christ and their mind is full of fear. If you get saved, Jesus Christ will destroy your life. He'll take away your enjoyment. You'll never be able to be happy again. You'll have to go about looking miserable. And you know there are lies. And there are lies put in your mind by the devil. 
Because the Bible says happy is the people whose God is the Lord. And and God is not only to be glorified, but he's, he's to be enjoyed. It was David that told him, fear not. And the Lord would say the same to every individual tonight without Christ. Don't be afraid. You don't have to tremble in my presence. Because the Lord is he that wants to do you good and be gracious to you. Mephibosheth was sent for, summons to appear. He he was called out from a far off place. He was counseled to come. He was told, David wants to show you kindness. And let's think of his obedience to that summons. When he came, he came with a confession. He came in humility. He came in honesty. He came in faith. He came in a spirit of repentance. He admitted and recognized his state and condition. And if you're going to respond tonight, you've got to come as you are. You've got to come in honesty and humility. You've got to come in faith. You've got to come in to repentance. You've got to come and admit, Lord, I'm a sinner for whom Jesus died. You, you, you've got to come with a willingness to turn from your sin, to hate and loathe it. You, you've got to come saying, Lord, I don't deserve to be saved. I, 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 I don't deserve your grace and mercy and kindness. Lord, I deserve judgment in hell. You're not there as an equal. Because Mephibosheth wasn't there as an equal. He was a bankrupt soul. He was without God without hope, without Christ. He had no rights to come. But he was summons to come. Also in this text, there's not only a tremendous summons, but there's a daily supply. It's tremendous that all that he lost was restored for Jonathan's sake. And here he is ending up sitting at the king's table, eating at the king's food. And now nobody can see his lameness. His lameness is covered because he's sitting at the king's table. How is all this possible? Let's just close with the thought. For Jonathan's sake. For Jonathan's sake. Showing kindness for Jonathan's sake. See, David had entered into a covenant with Jonathan many, many years before that. And for Jonathan's sake, he could be gracious and show kindness to someone in the house of Saul. And we can lift it up because we can have a daily supply in Christ. There can be a delightful sitting at the master's table and eating of the master's best Banqueting with him. Why? For Jesus' sake. God the Father entered into a covenant with his son in eternity past. And on that basis, God can be gracious to undeserving sinful men and women. You see, the forgiveness of sins is only for Jesus' sake. Being adopted into God's family is only for Jesus' sake. The privilege of knowing the Lord and being at peace with him and having eternal life and escaping hell, it's all for Jesus' sake. The delightful sitting. Why am I sitting at this table? Why am I eating at the king's food? For Jonathan's sake. And I I would say he never forgot that. Let's never forget that all that we have is for Jesus' sake. Let me ask you tonight, do you know and love Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord and Saviour? Have you trusted him? Do you know the dreadful state and condition with which you've been delivered? You've heard the summons of God to come, come as you are, and you have come and you're thankful. Have you got the daily supply? Are you rejoicing? Do you realise that all that you have is only for the sake of Christ? Who he is, the only begotten Son of God. What he has done, lived a sinless life, died in atoning death. And all that you have is in Christ. Without Christ you're nothing. But in Christ you have everything. See, all you need tonight is Christ. I've told you before. In the little sum, Christ plus nothing equals everything. Christ is all you need. You don't need religion. It's not the church that saves. It's not your baptism. It's Christ. 
It's not your religiosity or your respectability or right living that saves. It's Christ and Christ alone. May the Lord take these few words and bless them too.